Okay, uh, my name is uh, Viktor Sadovnikov and today indeed I'll be talking about the dealing uh, with the large code bases and how I ended up writing uh, my own software to help me with that. Uh, okay, does this work? Yes, it does. Uh, just for me to get used to talking in front of so many people, uh, I'll, I'll tell a bit about myself. It's okay to make mistakes here. So, first time I saw a computer about 30 years ago, it was just a playing a game in a weekend uh, at my dad's office. Uh, ten years later, ten years later, somebody decided to start paying for the code that I'm writing. That was, uh, well, a few rubles at that time, I'm coming from Russia. Uh, it still is much better than no rubles at all. And then, ten years later again, and this ten years always comes back, uh, I realized that writing another software to test your original software and actually to automate the entire thing is so much fun and in 2005 uh, cruise control was the only option for the build service I would say so lots of XML files no UI and it worked brilliantly I still believe that no UI is better than uh, bad UI <laughs> um, well in non IT related life I quite enjoy traveling and sports and the one I love keep comparing me with the crazy professional professor over there so and uh, if later after this meeting you'd like to get in touch with me you can find me with my last name is handled basically anywhere okay where does my talk start and actually not the talk the application starts with um, well I cannot say you where because the company wouldn't be very happy but they can tell that in 2013 I have joined the uh, common build project and the large organization that writes software for internal purposes and writes a lot of software and the idea of that project was to unify development processes and set of tools which are used to build all that software so within that project common build project we moved the, all the sources into a single SVM installation and mainly it was coming from CVS but occasionally also just simply from the network drive somewhere or a workstation in the office that was fun <laughs> Uh, the build tools, all the projects were meant, and they ended up being so, uh, were meant to build with Marvin, regardless of the technologies that these projects use. And that was a mix of C, mainly Java, XGAT, uh, also C, uh, PHP, just JavaScript, where you could zip things up and do uh, <coughs> naughty things like that. And before that, projects were either using Ant, occasionally Marvin, sometimes binary was simply exported from Eclipse that was fun and the dependencies of all these projects from now on are meant to be coming from an artifact uh, no, from artifacts repository nexus in that case uh, delivery of the uh, build results has also changed actually about the releases changed so before the results or releases were placed somewhere in the network now they are deployed to nexus again and that's possible from the build server only talking about the build servers they were indeed occasionally used by initiative for the developers, but that, that they would be running some with the workstations again of those developers. Now we moved all the project, every single project, uh, <coughs> to uh, Jenkins, which were automatically deployed, so they were all al uh, alike. And uh, we could prove that the application can be built at any circumstances. And just to handle those applications, we had also to automate the creation of those build jobs. So we wrote a Marlin plugin that would allow you, based on the form file, to create the build jobs, set up the build jobs. And migration, all that migration was done quite often by the projects themselves. I think they moved like three quarters of the projects. But we were lucky to migrate the stale ones, those that never have developers anymore around them, things like that. And you still have to build them. Uh, basically, we had a quite extensive checklist that every project had to comply with, and we kept on checking that against that, and okay, migrating those that nobody, <coughs> that people wanted around to migrate. And of course, we had some well, bonus scope. It turned out that, well, it turned out that company has the all test environments and production on Linux, but all development is done on Windows, and the build servers were also on Windows, moving builds to Linux. I have some fun, especially when a uh, hard-coded casting to a Windows GDK specific class is used in the code. That uh, doesn't help. <coughs> Another one is that these stale projects and managers of those projects use saw this migration as an opportunity to do a basic upgrades of GDK. It doesn't help, doesn't speed up their work either. 
the company turned out to, to use quite two quite specific packaging types. So it's something on, on top of your ER or for web applications or WAR. Um, for one of them, they've written even the Maven plugin that worked in most of the cases, not always. Another one we scripted using the assembly plugin in Maven, and I must say that was a mistake. Better write the plugin next time. And the uh, deployment had fun as well. A certain set of applications had a, such an interesting deployment structure that all the external dependencies were simply thrown into a single folder on the server. You, you can imagine the fun you have with the dependency management for that application. No way you can use the uh, login library with different versions. It will fun for all applications. Just to give you an idea about the volumes of the things we had to deal with, is that after the migration, we counted three and a half thousand of Maven modules, basically the POM files, only in trunks. So that's the main development source. Uh, among them, there was uh, nearly 1,800 Java libraries, 250 web applications. All that thing depended on 2,200 external libraries. They all had to be placed in Nexus. And to manage that, around 4,000 build jobs were created on those Jenkinses. That includes branches as well. So I couldn't separate the number. I, I was lazy to separate the number. And to handle all that, we started with 12 instances of Jenkins. Uh, later, it became so unmanageable because one of them had a very heavy load, others were lazy, uh, things started to deviate from each other, so later the setup already by the company was changed. They moved to the four Jenkins masters with a pool of slaves that were performing the jobs. <laughs> well, when you deal with such volumes, the tooling support is quite crucial, but funny enough, this is exactly where we started to struggle. Uh, tools were not helping us, were not doing exactly what we wanted. Well, to start with, uh, even finding the code in the SVN was uh, a bit of a challenge. So you got the sources on, of an application, and, you, and it's build script, and you realize that one of the libraries, dependencies here, is an internal library. You've got to find this library in SVN in order to understand what's the group ID, what's the artifact ID, whether there is a tagged code for the version that you are using, or basically just to, uh, or maybe just to find the developers that support that library to talk to them. Uh, and later, since we've seen so much code, we became kind of knowledge center for that company, and we started to get inquiries. Uh, do you know if somebody wrote a uh, test data generation utility? Uh, things like that. Um, you have to be able to find them in a sphere. There are tools that do this pretty well. Uh, for example, the fish eye from Atlassian. Works well, uh, you have to set a lot of filters in order to find actually the projects and not the Java classes. Uh, and it works only with the sphere. Maybe it wasn't a problem for that company, but later just I wanted to have something less specific on the repository. SonaCube from SonaSource, although that's more like for the code quality reporting, it does allow you to search as well, but it finds everything. You, you simply cannot find the projects, you will find the Java classes there. Uh, Another challenge is with shared libraries. These libraries are like Apache Commons. Uh, they are used everywhere. They're used by a lot of applications in your company. The only problem is that you don't know what are these applications and how many of them are around. And therefore, answering the simple questions like, can I, wait, can I stop compiling for GTK5? It's not really trivial to answer because you don't know your users. Uh, to make any change in the library, you have to think about backward compatibility. And if you would know your users, you would simply agree with them how you change the library and uh, agree with them. Um, uh, as well, you don't want really to have those users to use your old version of the library with bugs inside. So you want to stimulate them somehow to or encourage them to uh, upgrade, but you don't know what, what your users are. And Frankly speaking, at that moment, we were not able to find any tooling that would help us right away for that. Another one, conflicts of versions. Well, if you have an application that's very easy to start using a very recent version of a library somewhere, if it's your direct dependency. But still, transitively, you can be dependent on the older version of the same library. You won't see this problem during the build time because Marvin will silently resolve it for you by providing the most recent library. 
but at the runtime, one of your older dependencies might give a call to a non-existing method. And you have troubles at the runtime, not the build time. It's kind of delayed. So how can you learn whether it's safe to start using the new version of the library so you don't have these problems? Or how can you learn the complete set of projects that have to be changed, upgraded, released, in order to start using this new version of the library very coher coherently without having these problems? We just couldn't find an answer for that. And another completely different class of troubles was with uh, dependencies on snapshots. We just did our most to convince people to stop using this practice, but within the company, projects simply keep on using the snap uh, dependencies on the snapshots of other projects. And that gives you fun during the build time, and definitely <coughs> time you're getting different libraries. And at the, at the build time, you have this problem just because uh, either builds are executed in the wrong order, or they were simply executed on a different uh, slaves, and the snapshot was not placed in the, in the artifact repository. And later, I realized and learned that for such dependencies, sometimes there is no right order to build. Well, what currently helps you with uh, working with these versions is, uh, for example, Marvin dependency plugin. It works perfectly well. It shows all dependencies of your module, especially if you use the verbose mode of it. But parsing the result is quite difficult. And what's mainly the problem is that works on the level of the module of every single library, but you're releasing the projects which include those libraries. <coughs> That's why the mount plugin not extremely helpful there. Well, and another maybe funny problem is how do you find the builds? So if you have 12 servers with Jenkins with 4,000 builds, how do you find the build of your project? Of course, the naming convention should be able to help. Uh, but people keep on changing the names. And uh, you can also grab, you just can log into the server and grab the build uh, configuration files on your SVN location, but there are 12 servers. You can search the Jenkins old build page, but you need to know the name of the builder. Automatically generated build jobs were helpful, but people didn't like those names, so kept on changing. We made it more flexible, but still, names were difficult to trace. Referencing the build server in POMXML is a very good practice. However, you reference the entire server and not the build job within this, and therefore finding them within a <coughs> long list of build jobs is quite a difficult job. Okay, and these, among other reasons, these are the reasons, among others, that made us to start writing an application that's much later I call the Development Environment Cross-Examiner. What it is, it's a, it's a scanner that goes through your source repositories and the build servers. It loads descriptions of every project it finds and also of every single module of those projects. It learns the location of these modules and their dependencies. So we started very simple, uh, just as a standalone application that was triggered directly from IntelliJ and even configuration was directly in the code. It was doing the job that just we needed at that time. It was generating the JSON file that we could grab, we could search through, we were getting the whole information we needed from that file. Later, well, later I just couldn't stop and I kept on working on this one. And by that time I was already asked to go to the Unix operations department of that company to automate the deployment of all these binaries generated here. And uh, still kept on working on this one. So first step it was that execution of this application was scheduled in Jenkins and the resulted JSON file was placed on the network drive so developers could use it. Later I converted this into the intranet application with database to store all the data and with a UI to browse it. And quite recently, at the beginning of this year, I would say, I made it publicly available under this URL and configured to scan open source projects, just a few of them. So let me show you this application. Uh, yeah, it's okay. uh, so it starts with uh, adding source repositories, configuring source repositories, and scheduling their scans. In this list, you can see the uh, Apache Software Foundation, just all of it in, in GitHub, and Spring.io, just to name a few of them. You also add the build server and also schedule uh, its scan. And here I put the only publicly available instance of Jenkins I could find, which has something <coughs> to do with the, with the sources which have been scanned. 
So what you can see in the modules section is the list of all Maven modules, so Maven artifacts, which are found in those repositories. Currently, there are like 10 and a half thousand different modules found in those repositories. And it gives you access to the details of every that module. Uh, module. The build jobs section does the same with the build jobs discovered on that uh, Jenkins instance. It's quite a large one. It's also one and a half thousand builds. Findings is the last developed uh, section here, but it enumerates the problems the, the scanner discovered. For example, that's an interesting one. For example, people using the directories instead of branches in the Git. So that gives the trouble because the, the same Maven artifact becomes available in different places. Uh, uh, that's basically the uh, outline of the application and how does it help solve the uh, problems I was mentioning. So let's try to find something related to the <coughs> Okay, and what we can see here is the list of libraries which claim to be about login. And you can see them right away. You don't see them. And if you search the uh, logger, you will find a module which actually claims to be a logger and not every Java class that uses a logger. Uh, changing the shared libraries. Let me, f let me show you the details, for example, of commons land. If I open command lines, in the middle, there are details of the module itself. But on the right side, you can find that there are 336 other Java, uh, other libraries which depend on command line. And if current version in development is 3.5 snapshot, meaning that 3.4 is the latest released version, you can see that that library indeed uses the latest released version, but others are quite outdated. And that's maybe not a problem for the open source world, uh, where you hardly ever support the old version of your libraries. You just keep on developing them <coughs> and let those users to find out. If it's within your company, you will have to support the older version if the application depends on it. <coughs> uh, well, that list at least it, that it shows you what the users of your library are and allows you to start speaking to the developers. Conflicts of version. Uh, this is quite an interesting one, and uh, let me show you this on an example of Spring Boot, which is quite popular now. So, if we, if I open the Spring Boot details, oh, let, let, me, let me find another one. The Spring Boot uh, Web. Spring Boot Web Starter. Yeah, let's open its details. So we can see that there is a Spring Boot uh, uh, starter web, which is a library and a part of this aggregator. If we open details of that aggregator, we will also see that that one, in its turn, included into another one, and that is a Spring Boot build. So basically, you have a project which where uh, one aggregator includes into another one, and you have a quite serious uh, uh, size of the build. We come back to the details of the uh, Spring Boot Web Starter, and I open the build plan for that. What the build plan shows is that all dependencies of Spring uh, Web come from 18 different projects. And those projects can be built in eight stages and not faster than that. Why is that? Because uh, everything starts, in this case, with a Spring plugin, which doesn't have dependencies on any other projects in Spring I.O. Uh, library. And it's Spring also a data build, doesn't have any dependencies either. And the next stage, you build something that has dependency on the results in the previous stages, and so forth and so forth. So after repeating this step, after repeating this process eight times, at the end, and that's a very lengthy phase, okay? At the end, you can find and you can build <coughs> that Spring Boot build. This one includes 79 modules, uh, which is great. It's just a huge, huge project which is buildable. But there is one also interesting problem here. 
is that uh, something inside this Spring Boot build depends on authentication library of Spring. An authentication library of Spring has this different color because that one depends on the Spring Boot build. <laughs> so you, you got the problem between the two projects, but you never notice this. Just because explicit versions of dependencies are used, and one of them is always behind another. And Marvin resolves that during the build time for you by providing the most recent one. But if the uh, incompatible changes are introduced in one of these two, that thing with incompatible change will have to be re-released twice. So, for example, in, uh, change introduced here, that one starts using the new version of that one, and that one has to switch to the new one and re-release again. And uh, this application also will show you that uh, authentication library depends on 20, okay, 24 different modules. Sorry, pointer. 24 different modules at, among these 33 depends on the Spring Boot. So it seems like a very reasonable dependency. While only two modules among 79 depend on the Spring Security. So most probably then you can figure out the, and resolve this problem over here. Uh, that's about the version control, but basically it would say that once again, so what does this build plan shows you is that if a change introduced in the Spring plugin, you've got to go through the eight steps of the releasing 18 projects in order to start using that very coherently in your final Spring Boot. And another one is finding the builds. <coughs> okay, let me switch to the finding the builds and uh, I won't have any help to remind me what I'm looking for. Brooklyn, okay. Uh, unfortunately, that build server uh, doesn't have lots of builds which uh, uses code from the GitHub, therefore I will be searching for a very lucky one. Something. <coughs> Okay, Brooklyn, I hope that one will help. Yeah, if you open details of that project, it will show you that there is a build job found which builds this one. And we can open details of, uh, oh no, first of all, uh, in the details of, the, of that one, uh, it, it provides you access to the sources uh, here. So you can see where that project is coming from, where this uh, module is coming from. If we open details of the uh, build job, it gives you access to the, uh, all the sources that that build, build job handles. It shows you also the access to the build job itself in Jenkins. And it enumerates all the modules which are being handled by this build job. So you can quickly navigate between the builds and the modules back and forth. Well, actually, it's, uh, uh, I presented this application uh, about two months ago at the uh, Software Circus Meetup in Amsterdam, and this is where my original presentation was finishing. <coughs> but later, I got a question, uh, so what does this Decorex actually do? Why would I use this in, the, uh, in my company? And I'll try to answer this question, uh, but I have to start with describing the two different, absolutely different approaches how you can handle the code in the company. And actually this, I think, title and picture reflects these two approaches uh, much better. So what are these approaches? Uh, one of them is, we are very familiar with one of them, uh, which I would name like many repos approach. This is when every logically complete element or project has its own repository with its own release cycle. The build tools resolve dependency for your project from the artifact repositories. And this approach, yeah, as I said, is very familiar to every one of us, and it's heavily used in the open source software projects. On another side, what you could do if, is to place the all sources of your company into a single repository and do the tagging and branching just based on the entire code. Uh, in that case, you don't have internal version dependencies on internal code. You don't have version constraints on internal code all of that code is a part of one large build. And for some reason, uh, this approach is used by companies like <coughs> Google, Facebook, a bit less known, Days.io, uh, Twitter, Salesforce. So these companies have a reason why to use that one. 
uh, what are the pros and cons of both approaches? Well, the most obvious benefit, and that's why I think we all love this uh, many repos approach, is that it gives you a very clean boundaries between the projects. It's a very easy to understand the purpose of every project. And that makes this code is reusable in other contexts as well. Uh, since you have every project in its own repository, fine tuning of the access control is also possible, and builds of every particular project becomes a much faster and lighter, just because you're dealing with a very subset and the rest comes from the artifact repositories. However, this flexibility comes with a, with a price. Refactoring, as soon as cannot be handled within one your little project, becomes an incompatible change. You start getting these diamond dependencies and interdependencies, those cycles that I showed you on the spring example, uh, you start getting them even on internal code and this trouble bad enough with the external code. The commits, as soon as they come across a multiple projects, loses their atomicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, development uh, teams there is always a temptation for development teams to pick up a version of a dependency and stabilize on that, which is quite often the same as stagnation. Uh, the responsibilities of the code is so clearly defined that uh, fixing a bug in a shared library and releasing that in order to start using it causes so much effort that quite often it's not happening. And for the same reason, the obsolete and deprecated code, the volume of that code grows constantly. Uh, on another side, the monolithic repositories, they are refactoring enablers, definitely. Uh, because you have all the code uh, just in front of you, changing to APIs will, uh, will be reflected in all the users right away. Uh, you can move the code, you can spot the unused code right away, delete it. Uh, all your commits, regardless of how big they are, they are atomic. You don't have to switch between the repositories when you are working. You keep on working in one repository. And since you're looking all over, you are looking at the same code, and including shared libraries and everything, collaboration among team grows. Uh, well, you have only one repository, therefore you have less management of that repository. And CI, uh, well, every build becomes much heavier indeed, but you have only one project to build. And the code management, meaning like searching through the code, moving files around, changing the structure of the, of the code, or renaming the packaging, quite similar to refactoring becomes much easier. But these benefits also have a price. So ownership of the code becomes detached from the authorization on your repository. So if you have access to the repository, it doesn't mean that that's your project and uh, it's quite difficult to draw the line wh where that responsibility starts. And there are definitely an implementation problems. Uh, developers will have to pull more than strictly necessary for their work locally. Uh, your source repository logs will start mixing commits from different projects and you have to fi uh, filter them out. And Git, for example, doesn't help you that much. And fully distributed source control management systems with the large volumes are quite difficult. Well, uh, it's not going to be working, it's not going to be performing. And latency of the build for your project, even if you sm change something small, unless your build tool is smart, is smart enough, will be quite bad. Well, there are a few signs of recognition of this many repos uh, approach problems. One of them is semantic versioning. Uh, it was introduced, but basically it's a contract between a vendor of a shared library and the user of the library, <coughs> saying that I'm a vendor and I don't know how you're using my library, therefore I will promise you not to do certain things with that, so you can use it with some confidence. <coughs> Another one, uh, submodules and subtrees in Git, of so this phrase, you want to be able to treat the two projects as separate, yet still be able to use one from within another. That's taken from the tutorial of Git, and that's a clear sign of attempt to bring two or more projects together and deal with them at the same time. GitLab, although still requiring you to log issues and milestones on the level of every single repository, show you them on the level of the group of repositories which allows you to, to have more, uh, well, bigger uh, view on your project. The deprecated uh, annotation is invented just because you sometimes you're not 
able to delete the code, so you keep on marking the dep deprecated. And another example that we just saw, the Spring Boot has 79 modules under one aggregator. That's a good sign that they basically created one little more in the repository and work with that as a Spring Boot. So what I think that uh, Decrex is, is the wrapper for many repos. So I think it allows you to keep on using the many repos in your project with clean boundaries, clean code ownership, lighter builds, and possibility to use distributed source control management. But it adds to that the insights on your dependencies, so you can quickly spot who is using them and who is still using the old version. Uh, by adding the reporting on stagnated dependencies, just mentioned, and interdependencies <coughs> like that cycle for the Spring Boot in internal code. Projects, it also reports on the projects <coughs> that do not have any dependencies. And that means that since you wrote the code and it's not used, it's not, nothing else depends on it, it's either your delivery that you're using or that's an absolute code that has to be deleted. And the build plan pages, they is setting up the uh, dependencies of your build jobs and see a possibility to search through so-called mono repo now uh, facilitates uh, facilitates uh, reuse of the code. Well, what I'm planning to add to this application next is uh, uh, I'd like to ease the installation of that application on premises. It's just a web application which can be easily installed, but I think it, I need to change a couple of configuration files, which shouldn't be so difficult. Uh, a few UI improvements. I'd like to extend support uh, for Gradle. Travis CI and start using also not the GitHub only but just any Git implementations. Uh, for uh, there are a few bigger changes that I, I'd like to add is uh, configuring the <coughs> members of the mono repositories. The reports that you've seen uh, they assume that uh, all the repositories of one organization and GitHub they belong to one mono repository. Uh, add to concept of the owner of the code of every library project just basically on the source tree and start reporting to those owners about the releases of their dependencies. So that's basically the um, story of this application and the two approaches of dealing with the code. And uh, if you're interested in installing this and trying at your company, please <coughs> talk to me. That's um, no charges over there. And now if you have any questions, other questions, please. <laughs> uh, did you try to, to use uh, some Atlassian tools, integration between different Atlassian tools? Because you mentioned that Fisheye, but yeah. there are also other tools like Crucible and others, and Jira, I mean, uh, that, that can also give you an you know, overview of uh, like what builds you have, what. Uh, <coughs> versions uh, released, what are, I'm not sure about dependencies, but it, it also helps you to manage the well, different I'm, builds. And I'm quite familiar with a set of Atlassian tools, uh, yeah. but none of them seem to be uh, applicable here. Uh, definitely none of them go uh, upwards on your dependencies, so nobody will report who is using you. Uh, that's definitely, and I did not spot any <coughs> reporting on the version, uh, on the conflicts of versions in, the, in those days. No, well, mm -hmm. we're looking at that, but we couldn't find it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have a question too. The, is this uh, language specific? Can you use it for other languages than Java? Uh, well, that's a build tool specific. So currently it uh, supports only Marvel. But uh, I, uh, I'm well working now on extending support for Gradle as well. So it's not really Java specific. No. In Marvel, could I use it with uh, with npm of uh, Node.js uh, package manager? Uh, that would be a different build tool, which mm -hmm. I yeah. don't know yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so n no, at the, at the moment not. Yeah. Uh, I wonder. How how much, uh, how many opportunities you have to uh, have this tool also uh, do something, now it provides information of a view, I see it's a dashboard mm -hmm. that gives you information on which you can action, uh, perform action. I wonder if there is 
Yeah, I think that's exactly where uh, this is. This only just one of the things that are coming from notifying the code owners about their the dependencies. And yeah, I was uh, looking. Uh, no, let's put this tool start really as an information provider, but now I do see also in you make it so that it becomes actionable as well. And uh, even if you open the uh, Marvin details uh, project, details project, and you see that missing description, it would be much easier if you're able to change and describe your project better just directly in the tool instead of uh, forcing developers to go and um, update it through the code. And actions like this, uh, reporting on the cycle dependencies, and uh, well, if, if you're using a really far too old version, uh, that would be the case. Well, if it's needed for somebody. Yeah. yeah, you present it as a yeah. Okay, it would be it would be great to have a your tool as a central point to do to fix things mm -hmm. once you you know what, what to fix. But I was actually thinking about tool taking some freedom and just going and fix things within certain world. And I, I cannot tell you exactly what can be fixed with a with a uh, high enough level of confidence. Well, exactly it's or some clear dependency errors. Well, maybe you can uh, do, you can do, maybe you can really automate things like a creation of the uh, missing build job. So you found a project which does have a single build job. Oh, yeah. But even that, in every company, it's different how the build jobs are being created. It can be one build job that does everything, like religion on every company. <coughs> and another would do the continuous build that does sub subset of the tests. Another one would be a nightly build that does the so uh, source control analysis and then the completely different job for the releasing. So that would require so much configuration. I think that the easiest would be uh, actionable thing is uh, integrated with the tools like Gyro or something like that, that create an issue to do that mm -hmm. with a full description with the links so the developers would be uh, very clear what has to be done. But I would say the correction of these things is very uh, human dependent. Yeah. Did, did you have a slide with sort of issues? I saw something. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I think it wasn't a slide, it was the live thing with issues. Or was it? Yeah, that's the, the least final. developed section of this application, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. So, uh, you having your the discussion just now, it would be nice to have this in Jira or maybe upload it in SonoCube. Okay, yeah, that, that could be done. All of these issues are uh, only from scanners, mm -hmm. so when the things are being scanned, but not from analyzers, with, uh, or not from the analyzing which happens in, on the pages when you're opening the details of the things. Mm -hmm. However, maybe that could be automated as well. Yeah. Maybe you can upload uh, in, in SonoCube, you can have your, let's say your own uh, ma uh, uh, manual measurements, mm -hmm. so you can provide a file uh, and put it in the database. And yeah, and then you have it on a dashboard as as action along on the dashboard of SonoQ. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because mo most of those things would be uh, well for Apache for whatever reason they do have the cycle dependency that their parent starts depending on something that's uh, underneath of them. So the same cycle <coughs> dependency as I show with the Spring Boot, but based on the uh, hierarchy of the form modules. Quite often you come across the just simply embedded form XML files meaning that that application can be built at all. So things like that will pop up in that list. But uh, yeah, maybe providing the uh, dashboard or, or another view on the same problem scheme, uh, things like Sonnet would be helpful. Is it extendable information or? Uh, this findings currently. Yeah. No, that's the only okay. yeah, findings, yeah. <laughs> I kind of Do you think didn't you can help that that with uh, by giving also an advice how to fix that, or it can, I mean, is it, is it easy to analyze like what actions can be taken to fix, for instance, the hierarchy cycle? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that the scanner uh, has to provide 
uh, has to provide then all the modules which are involved in that cycle, uh, which it currently doesn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, uh, well, that, uh, adding that would be possible. But still, I wouldn't maybe try to automate creation of the gyro tickets based on that one, because you will get really lots of false positives or duplicates, I would say. The same problem is reflected like 50 times here. So then uh, I would say that here would be a possibility to create an issue based on the, on the uh, finding. So uh, create issue, I understand that. For instance, uh, can it automatically try to uh, analyze how problem can be fixed? If you have a circle uh, in your hierarchy, I don't think you can analyze where to break it. That's uh, e even with this uh, Spring Boot uh, dependency. No, well, I, I, I just have this to, to decide which to take first, which to put first and which the second. I, I could be easily swapped. <coughs> you don't know where to break. So the suggestion that you made is saying, okay, one has 76 dependencies, the other one yeah. has two, so it's probably better if you try to fix on that yeah. side and then you'll be able to break the dependencies. So it's not necessary to be good advice, but it can be. <laughs> <laughs> Taking that as a option, yes, obviously it's possible. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do fix. Do what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> do what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's the license of this product? License of this product? Yeah. Uh, okay, I didn't open uh, source this one uh, just because I'm still uh, not completely convinced that it's not needed anywhere. And uh, but currently, you can in this stage and during well until I think that's ready for production. Uh, it can be used for free and installed anywhere. So just just get in touch with me and we find out whether it's compatible with the technologies which are used in that in this case or somewhere else. And uh, yeah, we, we can install it, and you will be using that. Yes. I also, I also looking for source code uh, contributors in this project. Mm, I need some help. <laughs> 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 Definitely. Yeah. What's the starting point for the analysis? Starting point for analysis? Yeah. Where does it start analysis? Uh, the analysis. The the scan data is being analyzed. Only when you start clicking on the pages. So when you uh, when you are showing the details of uh, or no, currently there is no data analyzed in the build job. So only on when you are showing the data for the Marvin uh, modules, that's when being analyzed. And uh, when you ask to open the build plan, that's when it finds how you build it. Okay, but where where does it find its data? Because you you said it, it's looking at uh, Git and uh, Jenkins and but where does it, where does it start looking for the first data? For its first entry point. So ah, during the scanning. Yeah, during the scanning. Yeah. During the scanning, it just uh, goes to the root, asks for the directories. For Jenkins. Uh, for Jenkins too. Yeah. So do you have m multiple entry and uh, multiple data sources, or just it, does it always start in Jenkins and from there from there it looks for? No, no. Every repository, every repository. Uh, here, every repository have its own schedule, so it's uh, it has a separated scanner. Okay. And so it build, starts in the and build server also. So it's not we started as it was one single scan to, to do does everything. Yeah. Now we separated the per repository per scanner, and uh, they can be uh, checked at different times. Okay. So and, and then, then it tries to match up the the, the job the Jenkins jobs with the repository. Yeah, based on the based on the sources which configured in the build server, it says okay, I'm building that directory. And then every module will, will say as well that oh, I am coming from that source. But okay. when you open the details, it matches them. And you can find the pictures. Okay. Can you also do it the other way around? For example, could I uh, send <coughs> create a webhook in my Git repository and on every every push um, do the do a new analyze? Uh, that would be definitely possible. So if you think it's needed, uh, yeah, that would be definitely possible. Because okay. then you have a subset of changes. Well, um, actually, that's an interesting one. Currently, when yeah, this is grayed out because the scan of the Apache Software Foundation started three hours ago. So and that because it scans the entire thing. So if I would know the changes where the changes are or would be doing on the hook, then um, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be taken uh, regularly. Another thing that I didn't show you here is that if I open details of every repository here, for example this one, it shows mm -hmm. just a few last scans, so this one 
Dean complete. That's my back apparently. It didn't fail, but it didn't complete within so many hours. And uh, the thing that I wanted to show you is this one. So at the end, it shows you the modules, which does not have here any dependencies. So basically, it's the first module you can start building just right away in this repository. And here on the right, it shows you modules which do not have any dependencies. And I'm quite surprised by this number because it's a huge one. It means that either obsolete product has to be deleted <laughs> or that's actually a, a final delivery. And I don't think that you have 3,000 final deliveries. In uh, one insurance company, um, Tilburg, at CZ, I think, uh, I didn't install the application there, but since I was there, I scanned their repository. Uh, they're using Git, but it's one single project in the Git. So basically, it's a mono repository. And uh, in total, it was nearly 200 modules. So not a large number, quite a whole, it's not a big company. But it's so nicely shown here, three or four, I don't remember, modules. There was applications that they deployed, the test utility, and the code, the, uh, one module they forgot to delete. They deleted it right away. That was three. That was so that was so nice to see that you know what you deliver in this list. Do you think can be uh, helpful if uh, they will be um, marked with different colors based on, for instance, last update? Because that can also, I guess, help to identify the old factors. And okay. Yeah. The, like obsolete things that uh, was not updated for a long yeah. time. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, check out uh, subset of repository based on output from this tool because if I, I for example want to develop a subset of Apache repository I can use this output to decide I need 79 sub repository from Apache repository mm -hmm. which was parsed and then I should manually check out all of them or it could be done automatically by mark but things I need how no, and reporting from th This is one of the things that uh, using this many repositories approach uh, results in is that developers, if they need to do changes in the multi projects, they have to check them out separately and individually. Marvin cannot do that for you. So, with the many, many repositories approach, which is used all over the places, uh, that will be one of the, well, difficulties or challenges, well, minor, I would say, because if you, uh, if you are changing the code, you will find time to check out the code. Uh, that's all right. Um, I'm not sure whether I answered your question. Uh, no, I guess you answered. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did? Okay. Oh, good. One yeah. thing, I, 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 would, I think this tool is very handy for. Uh, I last week I got a question from um, our security team. Yeah. And they said, this package used by the whole company we don't know which application has a security issue, and they only yes. to upgrade to the next one. Who are the users of this package? <laughs> That's exactly the questions that that tool will be able to yeah. answer you. And then the next step would be if you add this to the to the build tool and say when this package is used in your in your project, build fill the build. <laughs> cool. <laughs> because cool. It's absolutely, issue. absolutely fantastic. But the only way uh, to implement this, I see that I'm writing the plugins for Marvin, for Gradle, whatever. That during the build, will go to that no. this application and ask, hey, am I allowed to use that or not? Yeah, and yeah. that's one possibility. You yes. can, of course, also make uh, make it as a hook in uh, in the project. Hook in the project where? In of in the the build job. Ah, in the so build it job. just asks, is this project using this dependency? Okay. Uh, but it's, it's still it's somehow implemented, so somehow the build starts interacting with this application. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a good thing. Uh, do you have uh, uh, makes a uh, REST API for, for this okay. uh, project? Uh, guys, so a, these are all provide? very good questions. That's why I do need support <laughs> for other developers <laughs> and new committers. But I was using that and writing that really at the <laughs> evenings and weekends. So currently not. <laughs> <laughs> But if, if things like adding the dashboard for the sauna queue <coughs> or creation of the uh, automating location of the Jira tickets are added, these things would just have to be added there. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm not disappearing, so I'll be happy to answer uh, next questions if they come up uh, over there or later on another day. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, um, <laughs>